All right, so this is Todd Atkins, and I'm back with Miguel Adorati of the Lights Out Podcast. This is another episode of the MMA Conspiracy Hour. And today we're going to discuss these latest accusations with Conor McGregor. Now, before we start, I'm going to kind of mention to, to you what it was. You know, apparently he was had a birthday party, I think it was July 14, in Ibiza, Ibiza, Spain. And at the time, this lady didn't accuse him of this. But apparently she did jump off of his boat. She was rescued by a Red Cross boat or picked up or whatever. So that did happen. That's verified. But what she's since come out with, and now the case has been reopened in Spain, not in Ireland, but in Spain, because now she's accusing him of, you know, that he kicked her, punched her, and then threatened to drown her on his yacht. So this is kind of the latest allegation against McGregor. So Miguel, I want to kind of let you kind of jump in here and kind of talk about your thoughts on this. Yeah, you know, I... How do you want to sum this up? This is one in a long line of this type of problem that Connor has. Nobody wants to mention, you know, the big A word, alcoholism here. Um, he owns a whiskey company, a successful whiskey company that's making him money, right? So, but no one wants to say it, but this is type of alcoholic behavior <laughs> that repeatedly catches up. And, and the pattern is there of, you know, everything seems all right for, you know, months at a time, but then there's a blow up and this, um, you know, the, the story the lady is saying, um, you know, I don't listen to it or hear it and say, oh, no, there's no way Connor did that. You know, I mean, it's very possible. He's on his boat. He's got his ego problems. I think it was his boat. Right. So I yeah. think he's got his ego situation, um, you know, fully in, in effect there. He's the king of the world at that point. You know, very few people can afford that type of luxury yacht and things like that. So he's got to feel in charge. And I think that's part of the problem there. I think that he long ago left behind that martial arts ethos of having a guide, a mentor, and somebody that you're following. Um, I think he, his ego has become more important than even the fighting. And that also shows, you know, he's 34 now. And, you know, since in, he's been in his 30s, he's fought very little. And he's eating, he's ate up, he's already eaten up his prime years, you know. And, uh, you know, with the injury, it looks like, you know, some alleged or potential steroid use and things like that. You know, is he truly taking care of himself? You know, whiskey use and things like that. Is he truly taking care of himself or is he deflated in in the eyes of, you know, the betting public and things like that? I don't know if he moves the radar quite like he used to. Yeah. And also he has that pub in uh, Dublin where he has to hang out and drink with people for, you know, their customers, you know and people yeah. taking pictures so i mean yeah he's having to you know use alcohol all the time and also you know this isn't like something we haven't seen him do before you know we saw him attack the bus we saw him punch the old guy in the bar so it's definitely something that's right up his alley if somebody accused him of it you know so yeah, it's no, not it's like something we would say, yeah for sure and uh the, you know one of the other problems here is that in some of the other cases, the repercussions haven't been there. And here, that's the question is, is, you know, the UFC just let Dana slide for a similar, you know, in a, I, I don't know that the, Ibiza is a party place, you know, Ibiza, I don't know if it was New Year's, but Dana on New Year's party in Cabo slapped his wife, you know, the other guy on a party, you know, similar. I mean, there's almost parallels with the problem there, it's one of those things where it's like when you're 25 years old and you made a fortune, you know, you might buy a red Corvette. This is, you know, I'm using old uh, imagery, you know, but you might buy a red Corvette. If you're 50 and you bought a red Corvette, people look at you like mm, a little suspect, like you're trying to make up for something. You know what I mean? What's cool when you're young isn't cool as you age. You know, those parties, that type of party, Dane is the old man at the party at that point. He shouldn't have even been there in public drinking like that if he's going to be out of control. That's my opinion on Dana. Now, Connor's still in his 30s, a little wilder, a little younger man and stuff like that. But without a guide, I mean, this is something where, you know, what's it going to take? It's going to take his bookkeeper to come in and go, man, you just took a hit in this direction. And, you know, then, then he might wake up. But right now, with income coming in, you know, he, he can't be told he's doing wrong. And I, I don't like what that means for what we'll we'll see in the ring when he eventually returns. Or maybe at this point he might not even return. 
I mean, he just made a post on his Instagram that he's being offered to coach on the Ultimate Fighter again. Who who would the opponent be? The uh, the rival? I don't know, but he just made it, so it's right after he gets accused of this, which I thought I think is pretty funny. I guess. You know, you never know with Connor and stuff like that. And the Ultimate Fighter again, that's a machine to put somebody in front of people every week. And Connor's star power supposedly doesn't need that. You know what I mean? So now you're gonna you're gonna go back to that old formula. It is sending Connor kind of back to the line with the other troops. Now they're thin at the top with you know Nick Diaz gone, Nate, I'm sorry, Nate Diaz gone and uh and Ganu gone and stuff like that. So they do need him more. But again, I th- I I've got the feeling that if he comes out and the persona hasn't changed, in other words, you know. He's not taking no for an answer. Somebody speaks, you know, and he, he's like belittling that person. You know, who the F is this guy? You know, if, if that aspect of his personality is still the same, he still wants to make the, the, the you know, the, the Muppet faces and yell and stuff like that. That looked tired to me the last time. And I think it is going to look tired from a 34, 35 year old man. It's just not the same to watch a, a grown man as a young, you know, man. So, I think he's suffering with some of that, that delusion that, you know, he's a, he's at the top of the world. There's no doubt. He's been UFC champion and he's had a, an incredibly successful life, but he's towing the line at throwing it away and he hasn't gotten caught, you know, enough to do it. But that's unfortunate to see because if you gave his opportunity to someone like who's done well for themselves, you know, like an Eddie Alvarez, but you would, so Eddie Alvarez, the money he made across his career now became Conor McGregor money. You would see that that young man took care of his family, did all the right things, and was never caught fighting in a pub or throwing women off a boat or punching old men. Yeah, and I have a question, you know, on the eve of Dana's incident, could this be something where the UFC says, eh, maybe we don't want to, you know, the people above Dana, if they even care to do anything? where they say, you know, yeah, we like doing business with McGregor, but this might not be the right time, given what just happened. So what do they do? Sit him another year? You know, I mean, th- that's the, 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 the re- that's the real problem with him is, like I said, he's 34, and these guys have a small window. And sure, he hasn't, you know, especially in the last few years, he hasn't put in a lot of miles on the body kind of thing. But maybe he has, you know, outside of the ring. But like in the in-ring time, he should be able to be, you know, ready to do a few a handful of fights and, and and be back in the public. But that's that's what I always worry about when a fighter seems to not be able to even return. You know, when they're coming up and they're hungry, they're all like Kevin Holland and Donald Cerrone, where it's like, yeah, I'll fight four times a year, I'll fight six times a year, every two months. That's great, I'll do it. And then the UFC makes them a star, and it says, you know, in order to build the things up correctly and for things, you know, we can get you two fights a year. And that seems small for most of the, that seems not enough for most of the roster. When it's too much for you, you should examine what's going on around you. Because if you can't, you know, if you can't stick to a couple of fights a year just to keep bringing it in and things like that, and outside incidents are part of the reason those those, those delays are being caused, you, you should examine stuff. I, I, Connor's ego is possibly bigger than John Jones's. And that's why neither guy really sees, you know, the, the problem behind their own activity. But you don't think there's any way that the UFC would say, we just had this thing happen. Maybe we can't afford to put him out front oh, you know, I, I un, until that, this case is sees through or whatever. That, that's very possible. The other the, the thing is, is with Nate gone, you know, Poirier is not, and him is not that interesting. You know, um, you know, maybe Connor wants that rematch and demands it and stuff. But I don't think he's got a, a terrific opponent. You know what I mean? If he fought Poirier at this point, that could very well be a a, de- a strong co-main event. You know what I mean? Except for Connor's presence, might they might switch the order at the end or whatever. But I don't. You know. I don't see that foil that everybody's dying to see him fight a certain person and those things all help. So they might sit him for a prolonged period of time. They might, you know, 
there are companies that could, you know, that might consider cutting him, you know, because of of of, of the misbehavior. It's, it's probably against the conduct portion of his contract, and they have to let that slide, you know. So yeah, they, they somebody could decide to make an example of him, but it's unlikely. Um, let, let's see how it plays out in court and if it goes further. If he looks bad, you know, again, I don't think he's suffered enough consequences for there to be like a correction in his public persona. I think we'll keep seeing this until something very severe happens, like, you know, a, a $50 million ruling in favor of the girl will, would wake him up. So would uh, the UFC cutting him. I think you're right on. And that, that might be the wake up call he needs. But I mean, like his coaches, for example, John Kavanaugh, people like that. How long do they, how many more times do they tolerate stuff like this? Cause it, it reflects badly on them too. In their gyms and oh, absolutely. whatnot. It's just a, it's, that's a financial thing. They have to be able to say your conduct is not worth me being around you for the amount of money you pay me. It still reflects bad on me, and I don't want to deal with that. And you know, because if Kavanaugh Kavanaugh's there and he's a man of principle, he might see him and say, "Look, sit down. I got to talk to you." And man, when a coach talks to a fighter or, or a, a, a protege in any sport. There does have a fatherly feel to it where, you know, it's like the athlete should sit down and listen. And that's where I think Connor is not going to tolerate that conversation. He's not going to listen to Kavanaugh like a father, get advice. He's going to keep doing what he wants. And Kavanaugh can either stay quiet and keep cashing a substantial check or decide, it, like I said, that it's not worth his time. And that's where, you know, people can make their own decisions on how how they want to play it. But Kavanaugh probably is having to sit on what he would do with your average or normal student. And that's provide some real martial arts guidance. You know what I mean? That ethos is gone in the McGregor's and the John Jones's of the world, that respect and uh, tradition kind of thing. That's the part that went out the window. They know how to fight. How hard do you think it is for somebody like him to, you know, keep getting kind of, I mean, he's not dragged into it from a standpoint that he's involved, but you know, to where McGregor keeps getting into these incidents, do you think it it might it bothers somebody like Kavanaugh, or does he not? I, I don't know him well enough, but I think it's a case by case basis. There are people who would move away. There are people who would let it go. Um, you know, when you're in his circle, if he's as out of control as he sometimes seems, you know, you never know when he could turn and you could be the target. You know what I mean? And there, that's a situation where, you know, Kavanaugh, it's like, I'm, you know, somebody in his entourage, somebody, you know, somebody might want to step in and just give Connor an ass whooping. You know what I mean? It's like, that could be also what happened. Like, I could see that happening in Ken Shamrock's Lions then if one of the students was out of control. You know what I mean? But I don't see that entity there. I don't think Connor answers to anybody in that way. And I think if there was anybody developing into that person in Connor's life, He's already shunned them because he doesn't want that. He doesn't. He likes the atmosphere. You can take what, what, what's the neighborhood called? Twelve, whatever the barrio is in the, in in Dublin. He's from. I know the proper twelve is from. The twelve refers to his neighborhood, right? Oh, you can take yeah. McGregor out of the twelve, but you can't take the twelve out of McGregor. It's a saying that applies in many different facets. Yeah, I mean it's. It's interesting. Plus, like we said before, he has this business with his uh, whiskey and the the pub that he has. So it's hard to kind of be out of that life that's not good for a fighter. Yeah, and but he likes it, you know, yeah. because keep in mind, if, if he's got $100 million in the bank, and obviously with the whiskey sale and things like that, and he says he's doing well, so if you take him at word, at word he's, he's he made a bunch – and the income continues to flow. He's not eating through it. So why don't you hire a manager for your restaurant, for your business, and go do what you do, which is, you know, fight more than once a year or once every 18 months, which is the pace he's been keeping for the last five years. Well, I'm sure he has a manager for it, but he just does like you see him there from time to time. I don't think he's there every day. <clears throat> You know, it looks like that from social media sometimes. But that's the thing is, is um, there's a line that, yeah, you're you're probably right. He's not, you know, 
at night sitting there counting the coins and you know making sure the cash register is okay. There are people doing that. Right. But he doesn't need to be sitting there and for people to say, hey, Connor, you know, here's a drink. All right, I'll take it, you know, and just and, and that rubbing elbows should be unnecessary to a star of that size, you know. But he likes it. He likes it. I don't know. It's appealing to some people. I like, you know, there's not like being received at a bar by people you know and things like that. Remember the old Cheers TV show? You know, that's <laughs> it's a it's a theme, and I think it's a theme. You know, drinking and all that stuff is a lifestyle that is across borders and people do it everywhere and things like that. And I think at some point that lifestyle has become bigger for Connor than the fighting lifestyle is just being rich and, you know, uh, yeah, frivolous, you know, partying with your money, you know, uh, not worried about it. You know what I mean? That's the persona he wants to give. And, uh, you know, and that's become stronger to him than fighting. It's more important to him. Now, put on your matchmaker, you know, experience hat here. How frustrating would it be for you if you were like in Sean Shelby's position or whatever? What what decision would you make? I don't think Shelby gets to matchmake Connor. You know, I, I think the other people people are there. It it, it it Look, I I'd rush to put it. I would have put him in the ring at any point, you know, um, I got a guy that, you know, if, if they wanted to make a catch weight match for Connor, say 176, because he's big and they don't want to do that, um, I'd put him in with Gastelum. See how he does with a with a guy who if he takes out Gastelum the way he's gotten, you know, by quality fighters, that's fine. That's fantastic. But if he gets dragged into a long fight, Gastelum it will have an answer for him through throughout the whole fight. He'll have to be fighting the whole time. And that's what I want to see. I want to see what he has because, um, yeah, I, I I don't think I don't think he's ready for someone like that. And Gastelum doesn't have that huge name or anything like that. And not that Gastelum's not beatable. He's been beat, you know. He's not. I also think Gastelum would be an interesting matchup for Kamza. You know, he's a, he's another guy that had trouble with the weight and things like that, but. He's experienced, and if he beats him the way he's been beating people, that would send a message. You know, Joe Mearshark coming off of uh, COVID, you know, wouldn't cut it like a full, like a fully prepared Gastelum. And I think that he provides that type of uh, opponent for Connor. That's the way I would go with him. I, I wouldn't treat him with any respect. I, I'd make him fight a very hard fight. So you think he's too big to where he could cut back down to maybe fight a Poirier or? Islam or somebody like that. You know, the UFC <laughs> might put him in there with Islam. I think that Connor is is probably uh gonna make the weight if he has to. I don't think he wants to. Again, I think he's also it looks like he's been weightlifting and you know looking at, at bulking up and things like that. So um a lot of the time, you know, going back down isn't isn't appealing. So yeah, maybe he'll put those behind him. I'm, you you ask me what I would do if I was a matchmaker. But um, if he goes back down to one fifty five and they gave him the title fight with Islam, that'd be another one in a long line of of UFC title tragedies where you know they're just they're not doing sport, they're doing spectacle. Yeah, but I think for if they if he is on the Ultimate Fighter and they could get him and Islam on there, maybe drag could be bent to it somehow. That that would make sense. You know, Islam on the Ultimate Fighter, if he has a Russian passport, good luck getting him to work in Vegas for a long time, you know, for a couple of months or whatever. If they can overcome that hurdle, um, you know, then you have to deal with the fact that he's pretty unappealing for American television week in and week out. You know, he doesn't speak the language and he's not a, you know, like a pee in the opponent's cup kind of a guy. You know, he's a pretty by the book guy. And if you don't mess with him, he's going to be pretty vanilla white. Um, and that would just be a purely a construction to get Connor back into the title picture. In what world does a guy who's one in three in his last four fights get a title shot right coming back? I don't think it matters in the UFC anymore. Right. And you're absolutely right. That's why I asked for in what world only in the UFC world. And just by right. If they said, we'd love to do it, but we can't because he's one in three. We got to get him another win. I'd almost respect that. But they don't even they cut that part of the process out. You know what I mean? And and kowtow to him and allow him. And then Connor, you know, I understand Connor probably needs a title fight or something big to even get motivated. 
And that, that's the part about when you've been to the top, you know, in pay and everything, though, it's hard to work for less, you know, in a lesser event, the lesser pay, everything. Why would you give your all or be motivated completely like you were the last time? So it, it's a very, Connor's not in a great spot as far as what the prospects are for his next performance. He could pull the rabbit out of a hat, especially with the opponent, right? But Islam would be the wrong opponent for he, I don't think he gets lucky with Islam. Islam is almost um, a foil for luck. His style is pretty much a blanket. Now, I know you can't predict something like this, but do you think the judge reopening it, is there anything interesting there or no? You know, I don't know enough about how those legal systems work to know if he's in trouble or not. Um, it can't really be a good sign, even if it's only an act to try to embarrass him further or anything like that. This is now going to that, – that's the thing is, is he's got money, and so what, what does this do? So now he's got to hire you know, somebody to take care of this, a lawyer, somebody to manage that situation there. And he's got a few of those open, or he's got a few of those that are, you know, creeping up and causing him expenditures. If one of them catches him and they make a ruling for a lot of money and he takes a hit, he's he's playing with fire on that. And um that that could be what it is, but I, I don't know enough about their lead what you know, they found more evidence or they think that they can prosecute, or they're just trying to embarrass him because um, you know, he's a public figure. Yeah, and that's the thing. It, it all comes back to how much more embarrassment can the UFC take from him, you know? Yeah, I, I think you're right. I, I wonder that this could be another test that we won't know for sure on, you know, um, Dana's power. But does, is who would be, like, can Dana say, no, we're keeping him? Because if, if, if Dana's contract that makes him act with impunity even under the new company was such that it, when they bought it, they said he's in charge until he wants to leave and nobody has veto power over his final decision. And they signed that thinking he's the genius who got the sport into the billion, you know, the into the situation where we even notice it. You know what I mean? So yeah, we'll ride that horse. He was a lot cleaner a few years ago too, in terms of bombastic and yeah, like that, but he didn't have, you know, women beating and things like that on his resume at that point. So I think they wanted to, they, they would have gotten rid of him if they could, they can't. And if his, his power extends to protecting somebody like Connor, he might do that. And the, the, why for the money and stuff. And I think Dana has, has that tendency that, you know, He'll recycle. Like, I, I think that the building a new star or something like that is something that they like to use the old guard guys now that they have that they built up and they're falling back on those guys. They don't really have, you know, O'Malley, they've got some guys they put some uh, coin into, um, you know, for the next generation stuff, but they're real heavy on the guys they invested in 10 years ago still. Yeah. I think that's something good to end on. You know, it'll be interesting to see where it goes. Um, now again, uh, this is Todd Atkins signing off from the MMA Conspiracy Hour with Miguel Adorati from the Lights Out Podcast. Until the next episode.